Am I on? Yeah, I'm on. Yeah. Action. Uh, tonight, I thought I would try to talk about the religious implications, especially for Christianity, as it is involved in the environmental situation of our world. It will include some reflections on the meaning of a creation theology and what it means to live as stewards of creation uh, in our world as co-creators with God who created this world. So uh, I, I'm going to start with some general ideas and issues about the environment, which you probably already well know. And then I'd like to talk about specifically how especially I think Christianity forgot a lot of its relationship of the physical world around us. And there's reasons why this happened. And also the encouragements that we are getting now to be involved in the environmental parts of the world, not because it's only a, a scientific or a geological issue, but there's a motivation for us as well to say that we have to be in communion also with this world that God created because we are the co-creators with this God. So that'll be the focus, if I can, to try to talk about um, religious implications. To start with, um, I just say, uh, this can be a very controversial kind of a topic when you talk about the environment. Uh, it usually gets uh, down to three different levels. There are those who just deny that there's any such thing as global warming. Um, I think what's behind a lot of it is that global warming and the issues that are involved with it are bad for business. And so that becomes a, a major issue. Just last week in the local paper that I won't mention, I saw this, uh, uh, an author was giving an opinion and he said, the climate obsessed green movement is the most stupidly self-destructive force in the world today. <laughs> when I read that, I said, that is probably the most stupidly self-destructive sentence that I have read in a long time. I mean, it's just such a generic sentence and it's just so overwhelming. Uh, but the author was trying to say that if you have to start uh, not using toxic chemicals, and uh, well, it's just, gonna, uh, it's just gonna kill the economy and that was the reason that brought down the government in Sri Lanka. If you can go with that, I think that is what we call a leap of logic. Um, there are other people who say, yes, global warming is happening, but it's just a natural occurrence. It happens every 10 to 20, 30,000 years, you get an ice age, and now we're getting a warm age. How they know that this is for sure, I, I don't know. But they just say it's a natural event and there's no human involvement with this. Now, there's a third group that say, well, maybe, maybe it's a natural event too, but human beings are living in a way that is helping to destroy uh, not only the, the climate, uh, but the very world uh, around us. At the same time I was reading that uh, author that I just quoted, uh, I saw another quote from President Biden who said, climate change is an emergency. When it comes to climate change, I will not take no for an answer. And a day later, I saw another comment, uh, the head of the United Nations said, we are in a global environmental crisis demanding a global response. My suggestion to you is that um, um, I think the majority of scientific studies which have been going on for almost four decades now give uh, a very supportive basis to say that what, what we are doing as human beings on the earth is contributing to ecological uh, degradation. Now, when I mention that, I'm not just talking about global warming. You know, it's getting hotter and all that. And we know that the temperatures are rising around the world uh, in a consistent fashion. 
the ecological movement is, is much bigger than it's just a warming planet. Uh, we're dealing with issues right now like drought, forest fires more than before, rising oceans that are probably going to submerge some of the small islands in, in the Pacific and are going to uh, raise uh, uh, coastal levels of water. So if you're thinking of buying a home 50 feet from the Atlantic, I'd tell you to maybe rethink that one. Um, we are dealing more and more with chaotic weather. Uh, the glaciers are melting. Parts of the ice caps are melting. Uh, the permafrost in places like Alaska uh, is melting, and which is going to release enormous amounts of methane, which is even worse than carbon getting into uh, the atmosphere. Uh, we're dealing with the extinction of species, of plants and flowers and insects and mammals and sea creatures. Um, as a possibility, we could probably lose uh, maybe a million or so species of flora and fauna as we go forward with this mess. I just read last week also the same thing. There's a the Chinese paddlefish is now considered extinct. And you say, well, so what? Well, this is a fish that's been around since the dinosaurs. So maybe it had some right to exist, but it simply was overfished and they built dams and it couldn't breed. The monarch butterfly is now an endangered species. And you think of all the species that really are endangered. If any of you have ash trees on your property, you know what happens when you get an invasive species uh, and what it does to the environment. We're dealing with air pollution. We're dealing with oceans that are polluted. There's some parts of the oceans that are several hundred square miles that are just filled with plastic. The currents just brought it there. And uh, there's river pollution with toxins. I think it was in Cleveland some years. There was a river so polluted it caught on fire. <laughs> Um, we're dealing with the loss of topsoil, which is going to make it difficult for the farmers to uh, keep growing. We're dealing with toxins that we put on the earth, uh, and we're destroying old growth and uh, also rainforests. You know, the president of Brazil has no problem with cutting down large parts of the Amazon, which are part of the lungs of the world, and also help to absorb all sorts of, uh, of carbon. So you can see in this kind of a look, it's not just we're talking about the world getting hotter. We're talking about business and politics and religion and carelessness and a rapacious attitude towards the earth as though we're the top species, so we're allowed to plunder the earth. I'll just give you a little example of this, how, the, how this thing goes. You probably know uh, Black Hawk, uh, BlackRock Corporation. It's the largest investment group, a private investment group, I think, in, in the whole world. They, they deal with trillions of dollars. And in, 19, uh, in 2020, uh, the head of it, Larry Fink, said, global warming is the most serious threat to the financial system in the last 40 years of its existence. So he sees global problems with uh, the environment. And he promised a, a drastic response. And he's going to ditch all sorts of investments that contribute to global warming and be transparent. That's 2020. In 2022, same guy, same company said, we reject woke capitalism, elevating the principle for us that investors should only agree to making profits. This firm wants fewer shareholder resolutions on climate change. These resolutions are not consistent with our clients' long-term financial interests. So you have a group like this that's investing multi-billion dollars, and they could determine whether it gets invested in stuff that's polluting or non-polluting, but the only interest is the shareholders and to profit-making. And that's the problem you start verging onto religious and ethical kinds of issues because you say, is it the only purpose uh, of a group, uh, let's say multinationals and all of that, to make profits to the shareholders, which is important enough, 
but they also have an ethical obligation to the world around them. Half of the corporations who have pledged to work towards the goal of we shouldn't raise temperature more than 1.5 degrees Celsius if we want to try to maintain global warming. Half of these groups who have committed to work towards that goal have no concrete plans to do it. In, in, 20, um, in 2020, in the, if you remember, in the year 2000, uh, there was a Paris uh, Accord on the environment, and it was an attempt to say, we've got to start thinking about, really, uh, global warming and the environment. And 20 years later, we're still spinning the same wheels about this. And in, in 2020, uh, 187 countries signed the Paris Agreement this was, in, excuse me, 2022, the Paris Agreement of 2020. And not one country is on track to make that reality of 1.5 an actual reality. This is one I, I, I really like especially. I hope you're not invested in, in this. 73% uh, of ExxonMobil shareholders voted against trying to reduce any emissions at all. So you see what happens with this kind of a thing if you start talking ethics and, and religion and long-term kind of goals and sustainability and uh, the possibilities of an ongoing creation. You're dealing with lots of people who, who don't want this because it's bad for business. Uh, plastic companies will tell you they're doing everything they can to uh, you know, try to mitigate the amount of uh, uh, plastic is. I recycle everything I can. I just feel better about doing it, you know. About six to seven percent of recycled plastic it gets uh, turned into something that's, uh, that's a renewable kind of plastic. The rest of the stuff goes into the earth or it's burned. So the people who are really going to have the power to do something about this isn't me and my little recycling. It's the big corporations that decide maybe styrofoam, which takes about a hundred years to dissolve, isn't the best way for us to take home the uh, big dinner that we shouldn't have ordered because it's supersized. I think it's, it's California now has uh, decided that they're no longer allow, going to allow uh, styrofoam uh, to be used, I think, in the state, which would be an interesting kind of a, an approach. So anyway, that's kind of the situation, and I don't have a, a solution to this thing all of a sudden, because if you come at the environmental issues, you can come from uh, a dozen different angles. But uh, one of the things I think that's been overlooked is the one I'm trying to address tonight. And what I'd like to say just now about this is, to some degree, Christianity lost its intimacy and its connection with the natural world, and we did this over a period of time. And uh, I've just come across three reasons why this, this might have taken uh, shape over the centuries. One is, is early uh, Christianity, when it was becoming a larger and larger kind of a religion, it took on cultural, social, and even philosophical kinds of forms to exist. And one of the philosophical forms, especially the major one, that they took on was Greek humanistic uh, philosophy. And that is a philosophy that is just very human-centered and individual-centered. So what happened is religion starts to take on that kind of an attitude where you forget the connection with a larger community, not only of others, but also the environment and the world around us. And if you think about it today, a large part of the general philosophy of life of a lot of people is uh, me first, I gotta be me, watching out for number one, taking care of myself. And when we came to the church also, a big part of it was saving my soul. Just me, my soul, I'm taking care of it. I think a second thing that happened with uh, uh, after this an over-identification just on the importance of the individual. Uh, it happened in 1347 to 1349 with the Black Death in Europe, where about a third of the, the population of Europe died. And they had no way to explain it. 
What did they know? And the conclusion they came to was, there's something wrong with the world. It's wicked. It's a sinful world. We're a bunch of sinners. Um, what we really have to do is put up with our lot in life, and then we'll be able to be saved for a better world that is to come in the future. So from the 1300s on, there was a, a real intense effort to work on penance, abnegation, fasting, mortification, and an obsession with death around us. And what happened is there became more and more of a detachment from this world. Why? Because this was only a short interlude, getting ready for our real home, which is outside of time and space, up in this heavenly realm. I think uh, what we have to uh, uh, realize is uh, the world is not wicked. It's not something to be run away from. Because when you read the book of Genesis, you see that after each day of creation, God says, and he saw that it was good. And at the end, he says, the creation that he made was very good. Um, and if you think about this, even I, I don't know about you, but I inherited this thing. A lot of attitudes that I grew up with, uh, a youngster, was a very strong emphasis on things like sin, forgiveness, penance. Uh, I was given some messages that the you know uh, human nature was somewhat corrupt with Adam and Eve, and uh, here I am trying to make the best of a bad situation. And uh, I don't think I always had the best image of myself, you know, as a God child and as a, somebody with the God spirit in me as divinized, it was kind of a, a heavy kind of notion where I went to confession about every week or two, not too long after that. And uh, I think a third element that really happened at the end of the 19th century, we saw a movement away from an agricultural kind of a community and a world into an industrial and a very exploitive kind of a society. Uh, once you start introducing oil and coal, um, you start digging up the earth, you get the attitude that the earth is just here for us and has no rights on its own and is here just to use us. We can exploit the earth as far as we want and without consequences. There's no doubt, folks, that we're dependent on oil and coal and all of this, and we're not gonna change that overnight. We're trying to take some ways that we can slowly make these kinds of differences. But when you see in some places like uh, West Virginia or something, they come, they just knock off the top of a mountain and get the coal and all the debris and all of that is just thrown down and gets into rivers and becomes toxic after a while. And you say, no, uh, we, we can use some of that stuff for good purpose, but you have a responsibility for what you're doing with the leftovers uh, f for the earth. And so what happened, a little by little, as Christianity became somewhat detached from worldliness, which was maybe somewhat wicked or, or sinful, um, the world was left over to the scientists who started examining the world and showing us what the, the larger world was around in, in, in wonderful kinds of ways with great kinds of insights. But the scientific world doesn't have the language, nor does it have the ability to talk about any kind of an ethical or a religious kind of dimension uh, to what this is about. So, for example, if you talk to some, the, the majority of uh, physicists, for example, they'll just tell you that the world we live in is just a, a random amalgamation of things. There's no purpose to this, there's no design. Whereas religious people would say, we think that there's a master plan behind this. We think that this is God's creation as well. And we try to argue this case. So if you just leave it over to people who within the limits of their discipline, can uh, uh, talk just in scientific terms, you're only talking about one kind of a dimension of what the world is about. And now I think more and more we're trying to say there's an ethical, even a religious dimension to this. 
Science can develop and even protect the world, but it can't control the world, and I don't think science is going to be able to come up with some magic solution that's going to make the environmental problem just go away all at once. Someone who is really uh, trying to encourage us to take the environment and its problems seriously right now is Pope Francis. And, uh, you know, in uh, 2015, he wrote, I think, a prophetic encyclical called Laudato Si. And in that, it, it's, it's a, it's a well-thought-out and, and carefully argued approach to the religious elements of what the environment is about. And in it, um, you know, Francis argues that ecology and social justice are inseparable because what's happening now in environmental issues is going to cause the most harm, especially to the poor people of this world, to the marginal people of this world, to the people who do the least polluting when their islands are overrun, or there's great droughts, or there's not enough clean drinking water, or there's no food. These are the people who will suffer the most. And that's why when people say, why doesn't Pope Francis just stay with religion and tell us how to say the rosary or, or uh, you know, tell us about some kind of devotions? Francis's argument is this environmental issue is a moral issue because it most directly concerns the poor and the little people of this world. Um, he, uh, Francis has argued, too, that it is... It is w vain to try to argue just about the environment if you're not also, in, in a particular country, let's say, if you're not also talking about the implications of it on the people of that country. And for example, in, in, in the Amazon right now, which is being cut down, indigenous people who have lived there for centuries are now just being moved off the land. Well, they don't move, they're, they're, they disappear, and what happens land that was theirs that they used and cared for, now all of a sudden is being used and uh, turn, uh, trees get cut down. And they turn it into grazing land so we can raise more cattle, so we can eat more red meat all over the world. Or they just use it for um, some kind of uh, s s survival farming, but the earth isn't strong enough to really uh, produce anything for about more than a year or so, so people have to move on and cut down more of the forest. And Pope Francis thinks that these little people have rights, even if the big people in the business and the, the, uh, and, and the politics and all that treat them as just disposable parts. Um, Francis is arguing for what he calls an integral ecology where we recognize that people and this planet are one, and we are in a communion and a unity. Uh, people before him, I, I just let you know I'm in good company, you know, when I quote some of these people. Uh, Pope Benedict XVI uh, uh, denounced the destruction of the Amazon environment very clearly, and uh, he spoke against the menaces, against human dignity, and the populations of the world, especially the poor. In, 2000 he said, in 2010, he said, if you want peace, protect creation. If you remember, Paul VI was the one who said, if you want peace, work for justice. Benedict's version is, if you want peace, protect creation. It was interesting, even before him, both the patriarch Bartholomew, who is really considered about the head of the whole Orthodox Church throughout the world, Greek and Russian Orthodox churches, along with uh, Pope John, St. Pope John II, spoke of what they called an ecological sin that is taking place before us, and put it into that category, not only of our own peccadilloes, but the big sins of the world. And even the World Council of Churches uh, now rank, uh, the World Council of Churches is mostly a, a collection and an organization that 
tries to speak in the name of mostly the Protestant churches uh, throughout the world. And uh, they rank ecology as a spiritual issue of importance. So um, the conclusion of this kind of stuff when, uh, you know, here I'm just quoting uh, Pope's is, injustice, we cannot simply do what we want with the world. It's not ours to plunder. You know, it, it's not much of a doubt that industrial civilization that we're dealing with right now um, is ruining the natural world. And that has implications for our physical and spiritual future. The world is not simply filled with objects out there to be exploited. And that raises an interesting question. Are we as human beings the only ones who have rights? Or do non-humans also have rights? It's already been started, it's appearing in the courts just a little bit now. For example, do animals have rights? Well, it's debated you know, back and forth. Uh, but um, is there a right to old growth forests? You know, that have developed over, over centuries and on. We're not used to that language because everything has been individual and human and we're the top of the creation. So we look at the other things as objects to be used. But um, what we're doing if we treat other parts of the planet as simply objects, I think we're working against justice and an ability to see ourselves in communion of something that is far larger than us. The future is about a sustainable society. And folks, I'm not, I'm not here as a tree hugger or, or um, just saying this is just all about uh, tree hugging. What I'm talking about is what's involved with this as the future goes on are big issues of peace, of justice, Poverty, racism, and if you find out where some of the most polluting uh, oil centers are and refineries are, very often they're dumped very close to neighborhoods of poor and people of color. It was just the way it just became just, well, well, we'll just dump it there. And even in the envir is environmental issues uh, today, as a moral kind of an attitude, they take up that kind of a racial issue as a, as, as a problem. This is going to re, uh, this is when you get to the hard part when you talk about a business. Uh, and, and business will be slow to change because they're interested in profits. And they're not quite sure if they really have a responsibility to the larger society. Francis argues that there's a possibility that there needs to be a change in consumerism, all the stuff, that the, the, the surplus of stuff that, that, that we buy. And, and, and the purpose of it is, is to get you, even if you don't wear it out, to give it away or throw it away so you can buy new stuff. And you can have more stuff in your closets. Francis is wondering, when is enough enough? And, and, and what happens with this, and then the businesses that just keep going on to provide us all the things that after a while they convince us we need. We have to have this and life won't have meaning without it. I'm not against nice, folks. I'm not against nice. But there's got to be some point where enough is enough. Francis uh, also indicates that a major place where this is going to take, uh, a difference is going to take place is in politics. Uh, the, pol the, pol the politicians are the ones who really will have control to, to, to make some kind of major decisions. Do you notice today that finally uh, Senator Manchin finally agreed with uh, Chuck Schumer and uh, they're going to actually allocate this big amount, billions of dollars now for um, environmental kinds of concerns uh, for the future. And, and you say, that's a major thing that these people can do. It's their job. It's to think of the common good, not just individual kinds of needs. And 
what happens, see, the problem is, though, politics is awfully involved with money. We all know that. Lobbies, special interests, all the influence that goes on that. And it becomes very difficult as a politician to maintain your integrity when you need to get reelected and you need enormous amounts of money to, 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 to make this happen. And that's why I say one of the things about this is, uh, what, what can you do? It's important you, uh, that you vote and you know how to vote kinds of issues. I listened to the promises in 2016 of the candidates who were running, and I listened again in 2020, as much as my stomach could allow it, and I hardly heard a word about what these politicians thought about the environment and the future. They're all talking about other kinds of issues and making big promises about things, and I thought, this is the thing staring us right in the face. And they don't talk about it, and you're the people that can do something about this. So I think with uh, business and politics and our attitude towards how we vote and how we spend our money, those are the only two things I think we got left, folks, that scare the politicians and business people. We have a vote, and we have a few dollars, and they're worried about how we're going to spend them or not spend them. Improved technology may help us a lot with environmental, I hope so, but I don't think it's going to be able to bail us out totally. A lot of this depends on maybe a younger generation that has more of a future. Uh, that's what Pope Francis has asked. He said, what kind of a future do you want to leave to your children and your grandchildren? I'm going to be dead before, you know, this, this really gets into, uh, you know, chaotic kinds of, kinds of crisis. But I worry about my great nieces and nephews, what, what they're going to have left. So it's, um, and, and what really struck me at one point, you know, several years ago, uh, a little 16-year-old girl had to cross the ocean uh, in a sailboat, Greta Thunberg, and she came to the United Nations. And she told off the leaders of the world. She said, we're tired of you. Uh, you know, th th this is our future, and, and you've got to do something. And, and we demand it. The 16-year-old kid had to come over and shout in the face of, of, of these people because somebody like that, this, this kid is saying, I've got a bigger investment in the future th th than you folks. I've been working, about, I've been worried about the environment since late 70s and certainly in the 80s, and I've joined all the groups, environmental groups, and you know, I, I, I do that kind of stuff. And I've told my nieces and nephews and my, my great nieces and nephews, in the future, when you're yelling and shouting and say, why didn't you people do something? I want them to be able to say, well, Uncle Richard tried, you know, he was trying to do something, you know. Uh, uh, um, and so I'm trying to leave that as my legacy. Of, uh, that. Um, there's a lot of other things they'll point their finger at <laughs> but, uh, for me, but um, that's not going to be one of them. Here's, here, here's part of what I think also is in this religious dimension of, uh, of, of, of ecology. Christianity has really emphasized the transcendence of God, which is, is important, the great other. But the transcendence of God is kind of up there and out there in the heavenly realms and we're trying to contact that God. And I think that affected us at the expense of being an earthly community. And the church became so concentrated on saving souls on this is a temporary world, you know, we're passing. So uh, 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 the veil of tears and uh, uh, memento mori, remember death, uh, uh, life is short. Um, I think what we forgot is there is an emphasis in scripture on the importance of creation. And when you think of creation, it's not just that thing that happened back there a long time ago. 
creation is ongoing. The creation is still taking place. And we are the co-creators with God in that reality. So much of the emphasis that we received in the, in the Western world was based on salvation of the soul and just of the individual. You had to take care of number one that we lost this emphasis on creation. And here's the thing really that the, the Greek church really tried to maintain. In, in, in the Western church, the big emphasis was God saved us. God gave us this great message by going to the cross. And the cross, after that, all of the emphasis in the cross was Jesus made some kind of satisfaction. He brought us out from the devil and death and all that. And God the Father was happy with, with, with this event. And we, who caused Jesus so much suffering, all this, we engaged a lot of times in just reparation, penance, overcoming sin, not feeling that good about ourselves. The whole other side of the, the Christian tradition is in the Greek church, especially preserved by the Orthodox church, of Greek church, Russian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox. And their big issue on how we are saved is not only the cross, I don't deny that, the big issue that saved us is the incarnation. That Jesus came into this world, into this flesh, because it's important and it redeemed us. So if you believe in the, in, in the incarnation, God coming into this world and this time and this flesh, then it can't, the world can't be negated. You can't say there's something wrong with it. In fact, what happens, the incarnation plunges us deeper into the world and our own humanity and a humanity as a community in what the creation is about. The Greek Orthodox Church, what they did is instead of putting all the emphasis on how salvation was a response to God, it's what salvation did to us how it deified us, how Jesus taught us. Instead of satisfaction, the Greek church emphasizes, you've heard the word atonement, you know, the atonement. It's at one meant. It's an attempt to try to say, even what salvation is about and, and what creation is about is to make sure that we can kind of bring things into some kind of a unity and a harmony. Part of that tradition is also to say, even if Adam and Eve sinned, and it was, it's to bring us through the incarnation to a greater and greater appreciation of our own humanity. We're not all that bad. Now, if you look at it that way, then you're saying we're not just worried about otherworldliness or trying to make sure God is not too angry at us or just my individual salvation. They're trying to develop some kind of an ethic that's intertwined with social justice and environmental ethics. You know, we, we have a lot of emphasis on, on ethics, you know, things how, how are we, but there's almost, there's very little that's starting to be written on now on uh, the ethics of uh, Biocide, how we're killing uh, the life forms uh, around us. Uh, the ethics of ecocide, how we're ruining the earth and, 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 and killing the planet. And there's no doubt it's happening, folks. It's, it's, uh, and, and what's compounding this, this issue, it's going to make it even more difficult, is the world population is increasing dramatically. They tell us that by 2000, we're going to have at least another billion or more people on this planet. That's more food and water and shelter and more people doing whatever they do to try to survive. Vast forms of migration. You can imagine 
You can imagine some of the wars that might start in the future with people saying, I have a right to go to some place that maybe has clean drinking water, and the people there with their shotguns are saying, no, it's my, it's my drinking water, you can't have it. That's where we're going to get into these environmental kinds of ethical issues uh, as well. Um, um, it's, it's interesting uh, to me is uh, St. Paul indicates to us that there is a sacred dimension to the earth. We either think of it, we can plunder it or use it, or say there's something sacred about it. St. Paul said in the beginning of uh, his letter to the Romans, um, I'll just see if I can, he's talking about uh, uh, whether or not the so-called pagans you know, people who hadn't yet converted to Christianity or, or hadn't followed any kind of a religion, whether or not they were guilty or they, were, they just didn't know what was going on. And Paul says, um, the wrath of God is indeed being revealed from heaven against every impiety and, and, and wickedness. For what can be known about God is evident to these people because God made it evident to them how so? Ever since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes of eternal power and divinity have been able to be understood and perceived in all the things that he has made. As a result, these people who do not accept God have no excuse, for although they knew God they did not accord with the glory of God and give him thanks. This is part of Paul's argument. Even before you get to scripture or, or, or anything, you look around the world. You've probably done this yourself at some point, haven't you? You've been on the mountaintop, watched the sunset, been in the woods somewhere, and you have this experience of otherness or, or more or uh, things that that go on, uh, any mother who has held her newborn in her arms and looked at this, this, this creation that goes on. Mothers all tell me they trip out, they're somewhere else when they're, they're, they're dealing with this. And, and they say it, it's such a moment that they can't even explain it. it it's just it's a moment of bonding and, and unity. And Paul's argument is, there's so much around us that gives us indications in the world itself of beauty, the connectedness, uh, nature, and all that. Uh, we all know that that, that level even of, of nature lifts us up almost to, to levels of awe and reverence and worship. You can finally get to scripture and the other kind of stuff, but lots of people just, just know it themselves from what they've experienced in the world. So um, the world, I think, is sacred. And all, in all of its physical dimensions, I think you can say it is, it is also sacramental. Um, you know, uh, they, they tell the story of there was this missionary, and he went to the Maasai tribe in Africa, and he was trying to explain to them the seven sacraments. And he explained it to them, he's saying, now look, there are these things, and we use a lot of material things, like we use uh, water for baptism, we use food for the Eucharist, uh, bread and wine, uh, we use oil when we anoint, when people get married, they come together as, as a bodily couple, uh, we use words in, in, in our life and experience, it's all very earthy and experiential, and God has decided to especially work with these seven physical, material kinds of things. And the Maasai chief said, well, if that's true, I should think there should be about 7,000 sacraments. <laughs> because if you think about it, the other ways outside of just these seven that we talk about are also ways of the physical ways that communicate a grace to us 
through just even their physicality and, and, and natural uh, existence. Um, so part of this thing is to uh, get into a, a communion, a reconciliation, not only between God and human beings, but between human beings and the world around us. When you start talking this language of um, does the world and beings in the world, do we all have rights? Does this world have a sacred dimension to it? Is it sacramental in its own ways? Does it teach us about God? I think you can make a strong case that, that it does. So um, when Francis talks about the religious dimensions of this, he's basing himself on th forms of theology. And I think one very important part of it, of course, is um, uh, the incarnation. If, if you believe in the incarnation, that, that God didn't ignore this world, but actually came into it in time and history and physicality, then you're talking about some sacred dimension of, of the whole world and who we are. You know, in the morning, uh, we get together and uh, we say morning prayer. We read the divine office, and it, uh, we, it's a lot of psalms that, that, that you read for morning prayer. And I would say in the last month or so, there's been stuff in the psalms that's just been leaping off the page at me about, uh, you know, uh, 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 God controls the seas and God controls the mountaintops and, and God gives it rain and, and all this stuff. And I'm thinking in there, you know, what we call our Old Testament, there's all sorts of indications that God is connected with all of these kinds of natural things that are going on. I just want to read one little part of it. It's, it's Psalm 65. Uh, this is one of them that kind of jumped off the page. Uh, you, God, you visit the earth and water it and make it abundantly fertile. God's stream is filled with waters, and with it you supply the world with grain. Thus do you prepare the earth and drench plowed furrows, and you level their ridges. With showers you keep the ground soft, blessing its young sprouts. You adorn the earth with your beauty. Your paths drip with fruitful rain. The untilled meadow also drips. The hills are robed with joy. The pastures are clothed with flocks. The valleys blanketed with grain. The valleys cheer and sing for joy. Can you imagine it? Valleys singing and cheering with joy because of all the things you know that they, they can bring forth. Um, I'm suggesting to you that um, our reflections on what's happening in the environment, to which I'm sure you're all attuned, um, it, it is important. I'm just trying to say also, there is a motivation for you in the fact that the care of the earth and, and, and the planet around us is motivated, motivated by a spiritual dimension as well as what we're gonna do with a scientific dimension to this. I'm gonna quit and uh, see if you want to have any questions or answers, but there's one other thing I came across which I just have to read to you. It's short. It's from uh, uh, Elizabeth Barrett Browning, uh, the author, and, uh, and she says, Earth is crammed with heaven, and every common bush is a fire with God, but only the one who sees takes off one's shoes. And that's what we're happening slowly with uh, seeing and taking off our shoes. Okay, guys, um, uh, if, if you have any uh, comments, questions, objections, reactions, criticisms, evaluations, now's the time to speak up or forever hold your peace.